In our final video about types of forces, we're going to zero in on one specific form of friction, and that is air resistance. Now, in our last unit of motion, we neglected air resistance for all of our examples. We said that all of the objects that are falling are experiencing what we call free fall. Uh, and in physics, that's just a fancy way of saying we don't care about air resistance. It doesn't exist. It's not a big enough deal to worry about. But the reality is if you're moving fast, air resistance is a big deal. Think of sticking your hand outside of a, a car window if you're going down the highway. You are definitely feeling the force of the air. Um, and the same thing would happen if you were falling at that speed. Um, air resistance is a thing, and it's important that we can describe how it would affect a falling object. So we're not going to do some major, major calculations with this, but you should be able to describe quantitatively and using some graphs um, exactly what's going to happen here if you do have air resistance. So if you want to talk about air resistance, you need to talk about how it's reacting with the other things for a falling object. So if you have a, a skydiver here, um, a skydiver has a certain amount of mass, and we can assume that that mass is not changing as they're falling, which means that the force of gravity in this case is pretty much always going to be constant. Now, it might change slightly if you're really, really far away from Earth. Gravity is going to be affected, um, but in the scale that you're going to be skydiving, your force of gravity is pulling you down with about the same amount. But the force of air resistance it's going to increase when the velocity increases for the same reason that sticking your hand out of a car window when you're just pulling out of the driveway doesn't experience a whole lot of air resistance because you're not moving very fast versus if you're traveling at 80 miles per hour down the highway, you're going to feel that force of air resistance immediately because uh, it's going to push back your hand really, really fast. So here in this picture, we see that 10 meters per second, we have a little air resistance. 30 meters per second is getting bigger, 50 meters per second is getting bigger still. So let's take this and talk about what it does to our free body diagram and our net force. So if we say that this skydiver is about 70 kilograms, that means that their force of gravity, their weight is roughly 700 newtons because gravity is about 10, 9.81 gets us pretty close. Um, so if we're going 10 meters per second, let's say that, that there's some air resistance, not a ton, uh, maybe pushing back with 100 newtons of force. We can calculate the acceleration here. Isn't actually going to be the acceleration of gravity anymore. It would be acceleration of gravity 9.81 if there was no air resistance. But here, these cancel out a little bit to give us a net force of about 600 newtons going down. So rather than the full force of gravity. That means that we can calculate acceleration. Acceleration is just the force divided by the, the mass. And here we can see that our acceleration is slightly less than the acceleration of gravity. So we're still getting faster. Um, so gravity is still pulling much more than the force of air resistance, but maybe not getting faster at the same rate that we would if we were in a vacuum with no air. If we go faster still, about 30 meters per second, which is about 65 miles per hour, um, we get up to 400 newtons of force pushing back, which means my net force is now 300 newtons, which means my acceleration has also gone down. 300 newtons divided by the mass of 70 gives me 4.29. And you can imagine as we continue along this path, eventually we're going to be going so fast that the air resistance pushing back is the same as the force of gravity pulling down. This means that the net force is zero. If net force is zero, it doesn't mean that we have stopped. It just means that we are no longer accelerating. So if you remember, the two scenarios that a net force of zero represented were not moving. So right now, I'm in equilibrium, net force is zero. But it could also mean that you're moving at a constant velocity. So in this case, that is the, the scenario. Obviously, the skydiver didn't just stop. Uh, they are now moving at a constant velocity that we give the name terminal velocity. So at a certain velocity, you're going fast enough that air is pushing so hard that it counteracts gravity. Um, so depends on the person what this terminal velocity is if you're skydiving. But regardless, it is whatever velocity is required for the air resistance to counteract the gravity. Um, in this case, the net force is going to be zero. So if you know that you are at terminal velocity, you know what your net force is. That means that this is your top 
speed for a falling object. Uh, there are some places that you can go that simulate skydiving uh, inside a building. So it's this indoor skydiving. Uh, and there's one fairly close by that I had an opportunity to try out uh, not too long ago. All right, so here I am in the iFly wind tunnel. And depending on the person, uh, the more massive the person, uh, the, the stronger the wind needs to be in order to find that terminal velocity. So here, for me, I required about 100 mile per hour wind speeds uh, before the force of the wind was enough to cancel out my force of gravity. So right now, when I'm pretty much motionless as far as the vertical is concerned, my force of gravity, my weight, is perfectly canceled out by the force of the air resistance. If I change my body slightly like I just did, um, I increase the surface area, which increases the air resistance, which caused me to accelerate upward a little bit. Um, so you saw me move up and down as I was playing with that balance of the net force. So one of the important things that you're gonna to need to be able to do is describe what a falling object looks like if it has air resistance. So just as a reminder, um, we've talked about with these motion graphs, what it looks like for an object to slow down or speed up. Um, so you're gonna see this here in just a little bit. Now, if I wanted to plot uh, the graphs for displacement time and velocity time of a falling object, I need to really think about what's going on. So if you remember back to those diagrams that we were saying, the force of gravity was always 700, and then the force of air resistance increased, 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 um, which basically said that our acceleration got smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually we weren't accelerating at all. We hit a terminal velocity. If we're gonna describe the velocity of an object uh, that's falling with air resistance, we know that it can't go faster than a terminal velocity because the only way that the air resistance can increase is by going faster or changing your surface area. So if the surface area doesn't change, you can't go any faster. So you're stuck there um, at that, that top speed. Now, what this looks like on our velocity time graph is we get faster and faster and faster until we get closer and closer to this terminal velocity. Then our acceleration gets smaller. So the slope levels itself off um, and then we level off here. This is the first time that we've seen a velocity versus time graph that is curved because it's the first time that we've actually looked at an example of acceleration that is not constant. So the acceleration here wasn't 9.81 the entire time. Instead, it got smaller and smaller until eventually the acceleration, the slope here was zero. What this looks, on a display, looks like on a displacement time graph is we are speeding up, so getting steeper and steeper until eventually we can't get steeper anymore because we've hit our maximum steepness. Our terminal velocity on a displacement graph is just the slope of when we can't go any faster. Um, this is our fastest speed. Note on these graphs, um, it, they're, they're treating downward direction as positive. Uh, IB loves these graphs. Uh, so it's possible that you might see an example like this on an IB exam. Um, so I want you to see it in the way that they would present it and they would present it as this is basically your magnitude of your velocity and your displacement, not worrying about the direction. So I had mentioned earlier that you can't increase your air resistance unless you go faster or you change your surface area. So if you want to go slower um, and still have that terminal velocity, the only way you can do that is by increasing your surface area and a parachute is one great way to do that. So say you're moving at that 50 meters per second like you were before and you very dramatically increase your surface area. Now that 700 Newton force of gravity is gonna be counteracted by actually a larger force of air resistance because now you're moving really, really fast but you have a huge air resistance um, because you have a large surface area. Now we have a net force that is going upward this net force going upward means that we have an acceleration of 7.14 meters per second squared in the upward direction. Um, so it's, it's counteracting in then some the force of gravity. If we go, start getting slower, that air resistance gets a little smaller because the slower the speed, the smaller the air resistance. Uh, so now we have a net force of 300 newtons 
So an acceleration of 4.29 pointing up. And then eventually we slow down to the point that finally we reach our equilibrium point again at about eight meters per second. Um, so that's a force of zero newtons. Now, an important thing to note here is just because the acceleration is going up doesn't mean the person here is traveling up. I'm going to say that again. So just because the acceleration and the force is pointing up doesn't mean the person is moving up. Instead, it just means in this case that the person is slowing down. So they're still definitely moving downward. They're not like floating higher uh, in the sky. They've just slowed down um, because the acceleration is counteracting their direction of motion. So if, if acceleration and velocity are going opposite directions, then it means you are slowing down. So if we were to plot this whole journey on one graph, it looks something like this. You speed up until you get closer and closer to that terminal velocity, which is about 50 meters per second. Then you open your parachute and very quickly slow down until you get closer and closer to your um, eight meters per second, which is your terminal velocity with a parachute on. This graph, this shark fin sort of graph, is a really important one as well. You'll see it in a variety of different places. Um, just showing you how you speed up to a terminal velocity. Can't go any faster than that. But then if you increase your air resistance, um, you eventually slow down uh, to a new terminal velocity um, that is much safer to land. So there are a couple example problems that Ivy loves to ask about, especially in the paper one. So if an object falls vertically from rest, air resistance acts on the object and it reaches a terminal speed. Which of the following is the distance time graph for this object that has reached its terminal speed? So remember back, we talked about this one as one of those two graphs. Which one represents the distance or displacement versus time of an object falling with air resistance? So if you remember, terminal velocity is just a flat line at the steepest slope that we can get. And that shows up the best in this graph A, where it's speeding up its curved acceleration until eventually it's reached its terminal velocity and it flattens out. Next sample problem, a skydiver jumped out of an airplane upon reaching a terminal speed of 60 meters per second. She opened her parachute. Which of the following describes her motion after opening the parachute? A, she went upward for a short time before falling to earth at a speed of 60 meters per second. B, she continued downward at 60 meters per second, but hit the ground with less force. C, she continued to fall, but reached a new terminal speed that was less than 60 meters per second. Or D, she went upward for a short time before falling to earth at a speed less than 60 meters per second. We touched upon this as well. Even though the net force is going to be upward to slow her down, she is still very much moving downward um, just at a new slower speed. And then our last sample IB question, this is probably the trickiest one. You have two identical balls that are dropped from a tall building, one a few seconds after the other. Air resistance is not negligible. As the balls fall, the distance between the balls will decrease, increase, increase, and remain constant, or remain constant. To help you think about this, I want to draw this picture. We have an object that's in terminal velocity. That graph looks something like this. It sped up until eventually it hit that constant slope. If we dropped an object a, a few seconds later, we would get the same shape, just shifted over a little bit. Looks something like this. So use this graph to tell me how is the separation changing or not changing as you are going um, across this time axis. All right, to help see this a little easier, I'm going to plot out the difference here between these two uh, at any given moment in time. And you can see that for a while, it's definitely getting bigger. So um, it's having the second one's having a hard time catching up because the one that was dropped earlier is moving so fast at that point. So throughout this whole time, the separation is increasing. But then eventually, they both reach their terminal velocity. And it's like this endless, hopeless chase that the car in front is moving the exact same speed as the car behind, they're never going to catch each other. These lines are parallel forever, which means that they are going to move 
um, next to each other parallel uh, and have the same separation. So the answer in this case is that th the separation will increase and then remain constant. So with all of that, the main takeaway is you should be able to describe the factors that affect air resistance and how that changes with velocity. You should be able to then describe um, the exact same thing. Uh, what I meant to say here is be able to describe the graphs that represent the air resistance and how that affects your motion.